Hi. So how you breathing? Just figured we would put that out there. You know, how you breathing? How you doing? What's going on? Uh, match is finally over. The initial plan was to be on at four o'clock, but uh, because of uh, the desire these days to make sure that all of the minutes have been added back on, they have been added back on. And so now we are officially on and here comes the Dutch or there goes the United States, however you want to take it. One nil win for the United States in the uh, win and in situation against Iran. And they have made it through. Uh, yeah, David, we'll get into that. We're going to go through the numbers and let everybody kind of catch their breath a little bit. It, it is true that uh, Walker Zimmerman uh, won 7,028 headers in, in his time that he was there uh, coming in to help out at the back for the United States. And uh, what we'll do for however long you guys want to go, uh, plan is to go until you, you're all talked out and you're just collapsed on your sofa. Uh, Sean will get into the why for, for all of that. So, uh, we're going to go to all the way to the beginning, come all the way through, and we'll probably just end up going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and, and discussing everything. But here's the numbers from, uh, our, our friends at sofa score. First and foremost, the United States coming into the match was a minus one eleven after starting out at a plus one Oh five. Your draw was a plus 240, and Iran was a plus 320. Lineups for the United States. Matt Turner and net. Anthony Robinson, Tim Ream, Cameron Carter-Vickers, Serginho Dest. Midfield, Weston McKinney, Tyler Adams, Eunice Musa. Up top, Christian Pulisic, Josh Sargent, Timothy Weah. Into the uh, substitutions. Walker Zimmerman punched a 7.5. We'll get into his numbers in a bit. Shaq Moore had a 6.9. Cal Costa, 6.8. Brendan Aronson, a 6.6. Colin, thank you very much. Haji Wright, a 6.9. So that's uh, that's your your numbers from our friends at SofaScore. Probably, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of you were wondering about the, the idea of starting CCV instead of Walker Zimmerman. And looking at Ream and CCV at the back. Morning, Bam. And uh, I'm glad you got a night's rest as uh, we were watching the, the last matches of the group stage for the United States. England, no problems with Wales, by the way. So uh, we'll get into all of the permutations and everything else that's going going uh, going forward. So, uh, yeah, Musa was cooked at the end. So that's your that's your numbers. And I know a lot of folks were wondering about Gio Reyna. And if, you know, if he is, you know, Emilio, to your point, that he really must be hurt, um, you know, why should anyone uh, request to know how healthy Gio Reyna actually is? And it gives you something else to prepare for. And that, that's what my, my standpoint has been uh, all the way through any kind of an injured player. I mean, think about it in the, the college football sense or think of it even better. Think of it in the Stanley cup playoff sense. When you have managers or managers, when you have head coaches in the Stanley cup playoffs and, uh, you have a playoff situation with an injured player, you always say it's an upper body injury or a lower body injury. And, uh, you know, it's, you're wondering whether or not, uh, someone can play. You sit there and yeah, everybody's healthy. Everybody can play. So, you know, any, any manager in any situation should, you know, and, and I know that a lot of us want to, to get information and things like that, but I know a lot, of, but I, you know, it's like, look, why give them one less thing to have to prepare for? Have them think about having to prepare for Gio Reyna. So, you know, that, and obviously the, the lineup up top, you had Sergeant Pulisic and way. I know a lot of folks were maybe thinking Ferreira, uh, it could be a part of the starting lineup. I know that uh, there were some national folks that were saying to start Ferreira instead of Josh Sargent. So, uh, you know, we we had, uh, you know, we, you, we had all of that as well. So getting into individual numbers on the day, Christian Pulisic scored the goal in the 38th and uh, could not go in the second half for uh, obvious reasons, for, for those of you that got to watch it. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was not pretty. But uh, Pulisic's numbers on the day in 45 minutes, 
XG of .45, two shots on target, one for two on his dribbles, 28 touches, 11 to 14 on his passing, two key passes, uh, one long ball. His duels, he was four of six on the day, three for four in the air, one of two, uh, three for four on the ground, one of two from the air. Uh, fouled once, one clearance, and a tackle. So we'll keep an eye, obviously, on Christian Pulisic going forward. Uh, getting into the, the numbers at the back, and, and I know that uh, – let me know. I want to know who your your MVP was today. I want to know what you thought across the board. I want to know who stood out. I want to know who your concerns were, and I know that Shaq Moore is coming up on the timeline as a concern. But uh, I, I think we we saw a lot from Timothy Weah today. I think we saw a lot from Weston McKinney. Uh, Tyler Adams, uh, Jedi Robinson down the left-hand side, Serginio Dest with his closing speed, especially coming back on defense. Uh, getting into the the absolute numbers, if you want to get into individual statistics, we can do that. But on the day, uh, XG was U.S.'s 1.12 to 0.49, possession 51% to the U.S. Total shots, and this is all, this is all the United States uh, dominant in these categories. 12-4 on shots, 5-1 on target, 4-3 off target, and three blocks. Iran had no block shots on the day. Five corners to one. Iran was offside more than the United States. They fouled more than the United States by four, 14-10, had three yellow cards. Uh, obviously, the U.S. had some big chances. They missed one of them, had a counterattack and a shot. Eight shots inside the 18, four outside the 18. Passing on the day, 84% uh, success rate for the U.S. on just under 500 passes. And Iran, 77% on four, uh, just over 460. Long balls, 36 to 34 for Iran. Crosses, 3 to 1 for Iran. Uh, the U.S. on the dribble, 110 as opposed to 4. And uh, possession lost was about 50-50. Literally, uh, Iran lost a little bit more than the United States four times out of 312. Duels were 50-50. Aerials were 50-50, which was really interesting. Uh, tackles 22 to 12 because you knew that uh, Iran was going to try to be as physical as possible, specifically against Christian Pulisic, 22 12 there. 12 interceptions to five for uh, Iran, and your clearances 20 to 16 in favor of the United States. And I know that uh, a lot of you are looking at what Walker Zimmerman did when he was called in in the final 10 minutes. Here's Walker Zimmerman's numbers just to give you an idea eight minutes played plus the 37 that were added. Three clearances, one block, clearances off the line, uh, two for three in aerial duels, possession lost. He lost it four times, 10 touches, two for six on his passing, one long ball. And that's, uh, then he punched a, a 7.5 on sofa score. So uh, it was good to, uh, you know, good to see what was uh, happening there from uh, uh, Walker Zimmerman. Uh, Serginho Dest on the day. Just to, to give you what it was with uh, Serginho Dest at the back. Uh, 82 minutes, had uh, the one assist, had an interception, four for two on four for 10 on ground duels, uh, two times fouled, 88% passing on the day, 37 of 42 on 74 touches, uh, one the one long ball, uh, two blocks, and uh, two for three on dribbles. So that was Serginho Dest on the right hand side uh, there as well. So uh, that's what you're you're looking at. Fifteen, yeah, fifteen or eighteen headers. Uh, all right, so uh, let's go through what's what's on your mind, and that's what we're here for. So uh, we f- figured we would do it this afternoon, earlier in the day, getting into the uh, match day threes, early matches at ten o'clock. Ecuador and Senegal. Senegal advanced two one over Ecuador. Netherlands beat Qatar two nil. So. Uh, Senegal is your two, the Netherlands won the group. So the Netherlands and the United States, England and Senegal, uh, next time through. So uh, Netherlands wanted a minus 476, Senegal at a plus 223. The U.S. were favored in England, no problems with Wales by a 3-0 scoreline at a minus 233. So your standings in those two groups, the Netherlands at seven points, Senegal at six, Ecuador with a win, a draw, and a loss at four points. And if you, uh, didn't see the picture of Moises Caicedo. Uh, see if you can find it on Twitter just to give you an idea as to what it means to these players to participate for their country. Uh, Qatar, uh, one goal, seven allowed. Uh, worth showing by a home country. So there you go. Group B, England, seven points on uh, two wins and a draw. Nine goals, four, two against. Th- three of them happening today. 
uh, the U.S., uh, five points, two goals scored. Iran at three points and Wales with one. So we'll get into juice boxes tomorrow looking at Group C and Group D, and we'll get you pushed uh, We'll get you pushed into the action for tomorrow. So, Sean, now I'm going through comments, so let me know what you're thinking. Uh, not happy, but you take the win. Why weren't you happy? Let me know. Uh, David, Musa was cooked at the end. He absolutely was. Uh, I, mean, I know that, Will, you have, uh, you'd like to see no more of Shaq. So let's get into Shaq Moore's numbers when he came on as a uh, a substitute. And I know that a lot of folks are wondering why he didn't just dribble to the corner at the tail end of the match. Just dribble to the, just dribble to the corner. Dribble to the corner. Don't worry about taking a shot. No, you don't have to worry about taking a shot when you're that deep in stoppage time. Just go to the corner. Uh, eight minutes played for Shaq Moore. Two clearances, two tackles. Two for two on ground duels. One for one in the air. So three for three in his duels on the day in eight minutes plus. Uh, lost possession five times. I know that's what a lot of you are looking at. 11 touches, two for seven on his passing. Uh, had one long ball, and that's your numbers on Shaq Moore, who had a 6.9, courtesy of our friends at uh, SofaScore. David, wife and I talked about the Zimmerman thing. He has not been in season a little. Thought it would play out like it did if we had a lead. Put him in to close, and that's what happened with Walker Zimmerman. Uh, David, Shaq Moore's a foul fest. Hasn't been sharp at all. Uh, no doubt about it, Kefsi. Great service from Serginio Dest on the day. Uh, and, uh, you know, those infernal Kefsi, those infernal Marta, Marta tunnels. I know it happens to me all the time. I always will lose. Uh, on the east west line, when it goes underground, I go from like five bars and 5G to nothing in a heartbeat. And it usually takes coming out from underneath the ground for like about 15 or 20 seconds before I can finally get a signal back. But if I'm going underground, above ground, into another tunnel, coming back out, then it, it's absolutely all over the place. Um, bam. Iran was in the best spot for an, an AFCON, for an AFC team to, to make it to the round of 16. They were. And all they had to do was get a result. You know, you get a result in this match, and then you make it to the round of 16. Uh, Dr. Three. Good to have you here. Can't tell me that playing in MLS, Europe, and CONCACAF hasn't had an effect on the national team in a positive way. Much more used to the housery than we used to be, in uh, your humble opinion. Not a surprise. I mean, when there was a lead probably with like, what, about 30 minutes to go is when you started, you know, you might have started seeing some CONCACAFery, and then the Iranians definitely were trying to draw cards, especially with that last opportunity that was uh, that was in the uh, – that was uh, inside the 18, uh, trying to draw a penalty on the, the hand on the shoulder by CCV and drawing it down. So uh, I think that, yeah, seeing the what uh, the, the U.S. players are used to seeing all around the world, you're definitely getting more used to the, the Ishhausery, uh, uh, Dredin, I think, I hope, maybe, I'm close. But to know, I think that they're so used to seeing that kind of stuff now that, that they're uh, adapting to it. Uh, Kefsi. And this was, in, in for those of you that were kind of looking in, at pictures on the Twitters, uh, good crowds watching games across town. No seats at the Brew House in Fado. Excellent. Good work. And I know that the American Outlaws uh, definitely had uh, stuff to talk about there as well. You saw that on the Twitters. And uh, uh, Bart, and Bart Keeler, I'm sure, has no voice. And uh, we will welcome him in tomorrow at some point, hopefully, if he's got, a, uh, if he's got any kind of a voice. And uh, Oleg Gustavo, yes, he did help a lot. La Hose, uh, let me let me get uh, some background for you on uh, the gentleman that was in the middle, Antonio Mateo La Hose. Spanish Association ref ref La Liga matches since 2008, 2014 World Cup qualifiers, 2018 uh, World Cup qualifiers, 2018 World Cup. Uh, and th this is what the, uh, the and he's uh, Valencia, Spain, 45 years old. Here, here is what the our friends at Wikipedia have uh, are, are describing uh, Antonio Miguel Mateo Laos his style Laos his style. He is known for his chatty and quirky approach to refereeing. Uh, Ewan McTeer back in 2018 wrote an article for uh, for Tifo Football. And um, that was before it, it turned into the athletic. But yeah, so 
uh, quirky approach to refereeing. And, and I think that what we saw was uh, there there were instances where he wanted to insert himself. It was almost very Joe Westish for those of you that watch Major League Baseball. He wanted to insert himself into the middle of the issue where instead of you know, just letting letting the issue happen, you're either admonishing a player, you're admonishing both players, whatever, you, you get in the middle of them, and there was at least one instance, if not two, where Laos wanted to have the players shake hands. And, you know, it's like the, you're in the middle of a boxing ring, and the, and the ref, it's like, okay, touch gloves. Laos wanted both, uh, both sides to, to shake hands after the foul, after the discussion, and after the admonishment. So that's what we were getting into with Laos today. So there were times where he did kind of insert himself into the situation. So, uh, you know, you had you had that going on with a quirky, chatty referee in Laos. And like I said, his pedigree, he's done a lot of stuff. But, yeah, there were times where he definitely wanted to try to insert himself into the uh, the center ring instead of focusing on the action in and of itself. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I think there were a few light touch flops by Iran. Well, later in the match, as they were trying to draw cards and try to get more uh, U.S. players possibly in yellow card accumulation trouble, they were really trying to draw it out. And there were some times where you're just like, nope, that ain't it. But considering what Iran was successful in doing late in the tournament, in getting a lot of a lot of opportunities and some goals and stoppage time, uh, the the one. Uh, the the one opportunity that, that once again I'm going to come back to the the hand on the shoulder by CCV where the guy ends up sliding into Matt Turner and Turner ends up with uh, with the ball and and uh, quick out and the U.S. tries to break back the other way that that kind of instance where the Iranians were trying to to get their to get their their ish housing in order and well capped and try and draw a call from either the the uh, the AR from or from Laos uh, you know that to me. Yeah, you were getting a lot of that in the last 30 minutes as things started to ramp up from the Iranians. They wanted to try to get a yellow. They wanted to try to get cards. They wanted to try to get set piece opportunities. So there was a certain amount of uh, ish housing that was going on with uh, with Laos today as he was in the middle. Uh, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, hiring to run pro for Major League Soccer, of course. Um, all right, so bam with a question. And guys, once again, let me know what you're thinking, who your MVP was today. Uh, what you thought in general? Uh, that's what we're here for. This is this is just getting it all off our chest. So tomorrow, when we get back to talking about other things, we can talk about other things in addition to uh, Group C and Group D, and uh, get into to those discussions as well with what A and B happened today. Obviously, as we keep going, you'll have gossip, rumor, and innuendo. We'll have the news of the day. Uh, there's some stuff going on at Juve that we haven't had the chance to talk about. We have had, haven't had the chance to talk about what's going on allegedly with Iran and their spectators. So there's been a lot of stuff that we've had to put on the table because we've been getting ready for the U.S. and for Iran, but we now know what's going on with uh, that. Heading into the round of 16, we still got stuff to talk about. Bam. With the U.S. making it to the round of 16, will that help with crowds at some MLS teams? Example, Galaxy, Miami, and Orlando. Um, you hope. I mean, you hope you do, Bam. Um, you know, you're you're looking at it, and... You, you hope that these places will end up with that, that World Cup hangover, but because it's in November and you're not playing until March, you wonder if that is going to be, in fact, the case, or are you just going to get that bump? Say if you're in uh, Miami Galaxy, uh, you know, so if you're Miami and Orlando, then, you know, are you sitting there and getting that bump, say, when Nashville comes to town with Walker Zimmerman? Uh, are you getting the bump, you know, or are you just getting bumps if you schedule friendlies with folks like Leeds and, and things like that? Um, you know, you, you've got to schedule. You got to get you got to schedule Leeds United, I think, frankly, if you're really going to get full houses. But uh, Matt Turner's with Arsenal. I mean, Walker Zimmerman is you know, Walker Zimmerman is in uh, Nashville. Uh, Jedi Robinson overseas, Tim Ream overseas, CCV is with Rangers, Dest is overseas, Eunice Moose is overseas, Tyler Ant I mean, the starting lineup, all of it was overseas. I mean, because once again, you look at the, the rest of the roster, Sean Johnson hasn't played. 
He's with he's with a free agent technically. He was with NYC. Walker Zimmerman in Nashville. Aaron Long with uh, Red Bulls. Shaq Moore, who was getting reps uh, at the the end of the season. Then you've got uh, Yedlin at Inter Miami. Christian Roldan, who's MLS. Kellen Acosta, MLS. I don't think that because of Kellen Acosta, you'll get a bump. Uh, Jordan Morris in Seattle. Brendan Aronson's overseas. Gio Reyna's overseas. Haji Wright's overseas. And Jesus Ferreira is uh, with the FC Dallas. So, I mean, you would hope that they would just off of off of the momentum of the tournament, but because of of what you saw, you know, most of it's overseas talent. But I think once again that speaks to how the United States is growing as a, uh, you know, as as an entity, Bam. Uh, all also, uh, David on our scoring play, I think seven of our players made a pass. Turner started, then build up across the back, across to the goal mouth. And by, and by the way, Weston McKinney and Serginio Dest on that play. I mean, the, the, uh, the big, uh, the, the big cross from uh, McKinney to Dest. So Dest could send it in centrally. So, uh, Pulisic could drive it home. It was ridiculous. Uh, let me get Weston McKinney's numbers on the day. Now that I'm thinking about it, let me give you McKinney. And since I gave you Dest, let me give you McKinney's numbers. So if a score gave him a 6.6, 65 minutes played. And I think that that's what you can get out of Weston McKinney right now. I think if you start Weston McKinney, it's 60 minutes because you could tell much like Musa at the end, Weston McKinney, 60 minutes, have him run like hell and then get him out of there. Uh, 42 touches, 29 of 37 passing. That's a 78% clip. Two key passes, the one, of course, leading to the goal. Three for six on long balls, once again, one of those leading to the goal. Uh, one for four on ground duels, 0 for one in the air. Uh, one foul, he was fouled once, and he was dribbled past once. But, uh, you know, you're looking at Weston McKinney's numbers there. He had a 6.6, .6, but he certainly played a lot higher than a 6.6. .6. Um, yeah, Emilio, to your point, when we're discussing um, the uh, attendances, Galaxy, yeah, they do draw well, but let me get the numbers now that you have me, um, now that you've got me inquisitive about it. Uh, attendance by team 2022. So let's let's figure out what could happen here. Uh, not MLB attendance, MLS attendance. So we're we're looking at that. Uh, and we welcome to the show, Jared Smith. Uh, Jared, have you caught your breath yet? Kind of. <laughs> So from uh, from thirty thousand feet, now that the U.S. is going to be uh, playing the Dutch, what do you think about uh, what do you think about the performance today against Iran? Um, I mean, it was breathless. The whole thing was breathless for all of us. I was unnecessarily breathless because <laughs> yes. there were wasted opportunities to put the game away. But uh huh, um, you know what? Some of the risks worked out. Tower Adams is. An insanely talented midfielder that the United States has produced. Weston McKinney was so far in his bag. I don't know if he's going to be able to get out anytime soon. Um, the CCV move worked. He had a couple moments, but he recovered nicely. And then you shut down shop and you survived. You survived a couple near misses as well. Um, oh, brother. Uh, Shaq Moore struggled. Haji Wright had a couple of moments, but overall, like, wanted more out of him. Yeah. Um, still not sure who's going to consistently score goals for this team. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a problem against the Dutch because uh, they got somebody who is in the golden boot conversation right now. Yeah, and I know that a lot of folks are sitting there. and uh, Getting into the lineup, I know that folks were wondering about the, and we were as well in, in our green room conversation, about why it wasn't Walker Zimmerman and it was CCV. And it was it was a hunch or a gamble or whatever that paid off for Greg Berhalter. It, I, I mean, here is the thing about it is, I guess for me, like CCV does give you a bit more with pace um, than say uh, than say Walker Zimmerman or for that matter, uh, Tim Ream. Yeah, and gives you more on the ball. And you knew you were going to be on the ball more in this game. He's better passing center back. Um, he, he's got that in his bag already. He plays in a system in, in Celtic that that you know has the ball a lot. And your center back has to be able to consistently move the ball and occasionally you know skip lines. Yeah. 
um, I didn't love the decision, but it worked out. So who am I, I guess, to get too upset? Uh, update from Sam Stej call at The Athletic. Per a U.S. Soccer Federation spokesperson, Christian Pulisic has an abdominal injury, and he went to the hospital for scans. He is not at the stadium currently. And that was put. That was released four minutes ago. Okay. Yep. And so, obviously, that's what we know. We know nothing of any uh, of any depth to that. But in the in the the build up to that goal, it was. I mean, there were passes. Uh, I think it was the the McKinney cross to Dest, and then the Dest entry where Pulisic slams at home. You're just sitting there going, "Okay, you you needed you needed a quarterback to to put that one on a dime and drop drop it in a bucket." And they both did that, leading to Christian Pulisic scoring. Yeah, like it's a great header across from Dest. <clears throat> the ball from McKinney is absolutely <laughs> filthy. Um, it's it's filthy. It's perfect. It's right where it needed to be. Yep. Um, it was everything you needed. You needed to get something before the half, and they did. Um, great work from him, yeah. honestly. Like that was fantastic work mm-hmm. that they were able to get that. That they were able to get it across the line. You yeah. didn't want it to be as stressful or as messy as the game was. Yeah. Um, but that's the hand you got dealt. And then you proceeded to play that hand really well. Good job. I'm still kind of breathless about it because in the it is uh, another in a long line of wow. Atlanta made that a lot more difficult for themselves than they needed to. Yeah. Or yeah. Atlanta. Sorry, a Freudian slip. Well, well, um, but yeah, but yeah, like I said, I mean, you're not necessarily wrong in the Freudian slip, though. Yeah, it, but the U.S. national team made that a lot more yeah. difficult on themselves than they needed to. Um, yeah. That is frustrating. Yeah. The bottom line is, uh, we talked about the Al Davis thing the other day. Just win, baby. Just Mm -hmm. win. Yeah. And that's what they did. Yeah. You found a way. And, uh, you know, in the the first 15 minutes, it was the pressure that we, I think, were looking for from the United States. And there were a couple of early chances. They, once again, you just were not putting the, the, the ball in the back of the net. But you could tell that the U.S. was on the – that they you know were putting their head down in the wind tunnel and they were making sure that, that they were in control in that first 15 to 20. You weren't getting anything out of it, but it, only, it, but it took to the 38th minute to get that goal in on the board. Um, in addition to the one lineup change, Josh Sargent makes his way once again into the starting 11. He's – He's up top. When you were thinking of your starting eleven, were you thinking Sargent? Were you thinking Ferreira? What were you looking at there as in the the Josh Sargent starting position, or were you pretty much happy with how Greg laid everything out, save the CCV swap? I mean, I was happy with the way the rest of it laid out. I know a lot of people wanted Gio Reyna, um, and I get that, especially after the comments that were made this week uh, right. with Winalda. <clears throat> Here's the thing, man. Timothy Weah has made it as hard as possible for you to take him off the field. Yeah. Uh, we are getting into a point now where, like, it's not even about, well, we need to get Reyna on the field. Like, yeah, that would be great. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also an issue of <laughs> I, if he's if he's not 100%, it makes more sense. Yeah. Um, but – it would also – part of that also is the fact that um, Tim Weah has done everything right to stay on the field. Like, he is making it as hard as humanly possible for you to take him off. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the strikers, man, I don't know. Like, the same question we have always had with, you know, Bart on what we've discussed is who's going to score goals for this team. Yeah. Still don't really know. No one's inspired confidence. Yeah. Um, you know, right in his hold-up play is fun. But, yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't know, man. It's, I, I I guess Sergeant was, Sergeant's fine in those moments. Not sure who else you'd go with. Um, 
Wright didn't show you. He had a couple moments late in the game where he was able to do all the play, but he didn't show you a lot otherwise. Right. Ferreira, like if you were chasing it, we were talking about this, uh, if you're chasing it, it might behoove you to get Ferreira on, but to shift it to like two strikers and have him play it underneath. Yeah. Um, but since you weren't in that situation, well, I guess uh, I, I guess Ferreira's just going to sit on the bench and be like the third or fourth choice striker. He's going to be holding the clipboard. Yep. Uh, Josh Sargent's numbers, by the way, 6.8 in SOFA score, 77 minutes. Shot uh, on target and off target, one each. Had a shot blocked, one for one on his dribbles. 34 touches, 18 of 20 on passing on the day at 90%. One key pass, uh, one, one ground duel, one an aerial duel, uh, fouled two times and had an interception. So that was the sofa score numbers on Josh Sargent on the day. So uh, Tyler Adams, let me get into Tyler Adams here. Uh, played the full 90, had a 7.1 on sofa score. Uh, 84 touches, 62 of 69 in accurate passes, in accuracy for passing. Uh, seven of eight. Tyler Adams, seven for eight on long balls on the day. Then uh, one had one dribble, and he was seven of 11 on duels today. Tyler Adams, seven of 11 on duels, one for two in the air, six for nine on the ground. Had uh, one foul called, and he was fouled twice, a clearance, three tackles, and one a one dribble pass. But 7 of 11 on duels today for Tyler Adams. So uh, Tyler Adams, once again, continues to impress as he's wearing the captain's armband. And I think that uh, part of it has that it's elevated his game. You know, we, we, we talk about the captain's armband either being too heavy of a weight or – you know, being just right, two of the three beds in Goldilocks. And I think that for Tyler Adams, we're seeing the reasons why he was given the captain's armband for the U.S. men's national team. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's, yeah, it, it is the conversation of, you know, the, the armband or the shirt doesn't shrink to fit lesser mm-hmm. men. Right. You, you, have to, you have to grow into it. You have to, it has to make sense for you to wear it. And that's what he's done. Tyler Adams has done great work in that respect. Um, you still need more. Um, yeah. yeah. Like, this is not this is not a complete team by any stretch of the imagination. This no. is not some like unless you have ma- unless you magically find someone who's going to score goals. It's I I still fear that it's going to be short lived. Yeah. Maybe even even as a Saturday you have the you have the Dutch. Um, but Tyler Adams is going to be very, very good for a very long time, and I'm glad we get to enjoy him playing for this national team because yep. he is. I think he is going to be a a mainstay in the world stage for a long time, and I'm really looking forward to that. Man, he is so much fun. Weston McKinney is when he, is, as he showed us, when he is in his bag, he is absolutely breathtakingly good. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, he's able to continue to do that. Early juice boxes, by the way, for the Netherlands match, which is set for 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. Uh, the Netherlands at a minus 114. Your 90-minute draws is a plus 243, and the U.S. are a plus 366. That's your early numbers, your early juice boxes on that. Uh, Gustavo, who is in, he says, a goals drought is what doesn't allow the U.S. M&T crops to grow. Yeah, using, I mean, using, using his normal, uh, his his lyrical and literal sense, Gustavo, uh, you know, pins it as only his as only he can when he is authoring his comments. It, it it just feels so stressful to watch this team because you know that they they're gonna have to be damn near perfect. Yeah, because they're not gonna score enough goals as it's constructed to make up for not being damn near perfect. Yes. And it's really frustrating um, because you have talented guys. They cannot, for the life of them, yep. seem to finish off moves, like allergic to it kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gustavo is saying maybe a striker should be nat- nationalized. I don't know if you can get something done quickly before Saturday or, or have some kind of an injury replacement. But, I mean, what you've seen from – and, 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 you know, and, Jared, this is a point that you've been making. Brandon Vasquez. It doesn't even have to be him. Um, 
you know, Bart talked about PFOC. Yeah, yeah. cool, yeah. great. Guys like that. Like, guys like that, though, who, who have been doing well for, you know, for their, for their specific teams. Mm-hmm. Like, go get them. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Dredeen. Man, I wish we had Miles playing. That injury sucked for United in the USA. You're not kidding. Yeah. Um, it, and, and to be fair, though, um, Tim Ream at like 35 years old yeah. has hardly put a foot wrong. Yeah. Being called into being called into service mm-hmm. in a tough situation where we weren't sure, you know, who was going to be the running mate for Walker Zimmerman. That's the guy we just assumed it was going to be. Um, that, that Zimmerman was going to be one of them, and we weren't sure who the other guy was going to be. CCB was part of that conversation. But, man, Tim Ream has hardly put a foot wrong. He's been outstanding. Yep. I don't know how you can be critical of him. No. Um, it, it, it's funny because, you know, of all the concern we had for, you know, for having uh, for having Tim Ream to be that guy, it's Walker Zimmerman that gets to start on the bench today. Yeah, Absolutely. And uh, you, you know, I'm trying to sit here and look for look for results, and it's not up yet. Curses, foiled again. For results, it's no, like the USA won one nothing. Well, no, yeah, no, it's just like other things, other than just the Sofa score numbers going into the deeper passing numbers, like we get to see at FB Rep. Those haven't been posted yet. Uh, Tim Ream on the day, uh, seven point two on Sofa score, ninety minutes, four clearances, one interception. Let's see, uh, 67 touches, 92% accuracy in his passing, 54 of 59, 5 of 6 on long balls today. So you're seeing both sides of the equation here from Tim Ream, solid as a center back, and then 54 completed passes out of almost 60. So he was an A- minus on his passing, 5 of 6 on long balls today. And I think that was something else that you saw from uh, the United States, their long ball numbers were out of this world against Iran today. It had to be. I mean, that's team, but that, and that just, it, we talked about this uh, with the England game about the way teams press. Like, sometimes you have to, it's pushed for a different reason. Like, yeah. you're going to have to have that long ball because as they kind of, um, you know, as you catch them in transition moments when they do come out of their shell, you know, you have to be able to, you have to be able to hit the, hit, hit them quickly. And yep. sometimes it's going to be that long ball. Sometimes it's going to be, you know, hitting a big diagonal, a big switch. And it's going to be about, like, sucking in the defense and then making it, and then making them suffer for that decision. Yeah. You know, and you're looking at uh, all these other things. So statistics, let me get into individual stats. Let me see if we can get uh, other player stuff that we've seen. You have uh, Iran with their numbers, the U.S., uh, a lot of XG and a lot of tackles and passing proficiency and things like that. So uh, we'll see. We'll see when they get posted on tomorrow's show. We'll go through it and uh, see what else is going on. Uh, Yeah, I mean, Will is a part of it, you know, with the free Geo Reign a bit. But once again, just remember, it's injury-based. And the, like, I mean, so far as we know, like, yeah, and, you know, and, has there been anything said about that otherwise? No, but then, but that's the thing. It's like I would always maintain that it's you know it's a need to know business, and we don't need to know. I mean, it is, but like in that sense, like I I, I understand people's frustration about it because he is a talented player. I but like I said before, I I do think some of it is the fact that. Tim Way has made it really hard to get him on the field, man. Like yeah. Way has done everything right, everything you would have asked of him. Yeah. Um, so it's hard for me to get like too, you know, over the top mad. Yeah. Because Tim Way has done all of this. It's not like it's not like Ray is languishing on the bench. Yeah. Or uh, uh, Rain is languishing on the bench while Tim Way is out there doing nothing. Like Tim Way has been outstanding. Um, yeah. He has a goal in this tournament. He's had three really good performances. Now yep. guys are running out of gas. Like Weston McKinney looks like he has about what 60, 65 minutes in him every game. Yeah, yeah. We we yeah, I mentioned that before you came on is that I think that he's let him run like hell for sixty or sixty five and then shore it up. Seems to be where it's getting. Um, and you're getting what you can out of guys. Um, which is fine. I mean, it's 
it's frustrating, but you're gonna you are gonna need everybody. You're gonna need everybody going forward. You're mm-hmm. gonna need everybody for the Netherlands yep. um, to just try and survive that match. Yeah. Um, I know people have already started the conversation of you know does this buy Greg another another cycle like. I don't like that idea simply yeah. because I am of the philosophy of a coach gets a cycle. Yeah, I'm, once I'm his ready. cycle, once his cycle is done, that is it, yeah. and we move on to someone else. Will wants a way to play as a nine. Dude, I I think he actually did that in Glasgow for a bit when he was um when he was a Celtic on loan, and yeah, it was actually pretty good. Um, if if you had shoehorned them on, I mean, why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so of course, here's Will <laughs> chasing after strikers. Mbappé, Mbappé, USA. <laughs> I, I don't quite think that he could transfer over, especially in the middle of a tournament. Uh, yeah, KFC loves seeing way as long as possible, and uh, is somewhat wondering if Mexico goes out, can you bring in Tata on as a consultant? Uh, yeah, it was announced, uh, Tuta NA put out a story yesterday, I believe, that uh, once the tournament is over, Tata Martino is done as, as uh, head coach of the Mexican national team. No real surprise. And, you know, once again, under normal circumstances, you know, we, we talk about Jarrett and I are one cycle guys. It would take something, you know, Herculean or Yogi Luvian to, to have something going where he's going to be your guy and be your guy and be your guy. He would need to make a quarterfinal yeah. and, like, play his ass off in a quarterfinal and lose, like, German handball uncalled at the line, kind of, like, lose a hard luck game like that where they played well, for, I think, for me to even entertain the idea of another cycle of Greg Berhalter. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm that way with just about any coach. I mean, yeah. you would have to maul the entire planet, I, I think, for me, to, for me to endorse another cycle of a coach. It's yep. hard. No question. That's just me. Yeah. Uh, Will is like, I swear, if uh, 3GB ever becomes the Atlanta manager, I'm becoming a Nashville fan. Uh, and- Some of y'all are in hell, man. You know what? Uh, we almost ran into a really fun situation because if he hadn't uh, if he hadn't been fired after the Euros went to hell on him, we could have had Frank DeBoer going up against, uh, against the United States national team, and I would have thoroughly enjoyed that storyline. Mm-hmm. Uh- and uh, Will also st- strategically doesn't understand why Greg insists on not having one of the wingers play through the middle. I mean, if you're... Uh, if- he, he, uh, Greg is a, not a slave, but Greg loves to do what Greg wants to do. He has yeah. a method, and he's going to do his thing. Mm-hmm. That is true. Uh, also on the board, uh, 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 Airborne DJ... Hates Burhalter just to go on the record. Uh, Gustavo, team has a good defense, a good midfield, and Polisic. We need more goals and better finishers. Sargent was like a rugby prop. He was saturating the Iranian def- defense to weaken it today. I mean, sometimes you need that. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes you need that guy to play up there and do the dirty work and do the yeah. hard work and just kind of you know beat up the defense a bit. But it's 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 tough to do, man. Um, yes. It's a tough role for him. Yep. And it's a tough role because it can be thankless at times. Yep. Uh, Tom once again says that we, uh, we mean the United States advanced in spite of Greg Berhalter. That's what, that's what Tom is saying. I mean, I think you got through with, with talent that you had and also uh, a group that let you be less than perfect. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. You never apologize for having a group that allows you to be less than perfect. Anyone who does needs to chill the hell out, in my opinion. Um, you don't have to take the hardest road to feel like you've accomplished something. Yeah. You get a group where, okay, you should have beaten Wales. You should have put them away in the first half. Um, England, you played to a draw, but you outplayed them, in my opinion. Like You took the fight to England, and England looked like they didn't know what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you beat Iran because you had uh, you had the talent to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, it took a little moments of, of brilliance. So you're able to talent your way through it, and that's fine. It's not perfect. Yeah, it's fine. It gets yeah. done. Yeah. Um, 
Like I said, I, I don't know of a situation in which I endorse another cycle for Greg. If he gets one, I'm going to be disappointed. Yeah. Uh, to your point, Kefsi, you think the goal's achieved and you can't hate that. Anything else is gravy, but you don't see much more from what we saw already. Yeah, I mean, it's... You, the, I think the goal, the goal, at least the first level goal, would have been, should have been to get out of the group. With this, with this, yeah, with this collection of players, I think that the first goal should be get out of group, and then you know it's knockouts. Anything can happen. So prove that you can get yeah, out and, of group, and then go from there. And Will's right; they use Mbappe outside because they have Olivier Giroud, who is very likely going to end up breaking Thierry Henry's goal record for a French international because uh, Olivier Giroud is going to somehow go down. Uh, is an insanely underrated uh, goal scorer. Yeah, it's wild. Um, he's been fantastic for a long time, and I know he was kind of the butt of joke, butt of the joke for a lot of the the French, you know, a decade ago, or for all the Arsenal fans and the French for a decade ago. He's been really good, man. Mm-hmm. Olivier Giroud has been really good. Um, it does raise the idea of like. Hey, what if we just had, you know, at one point, you know, Stu Holt begging them on the broadcast to be like, hey, Tim Weah, drive at it, drive at your guy. You know, uh, Serginio Dest, when you get that over, overlap and you get, like, somebody on their heels, drive at them. You know, try and create those moments. Try and force the issue. Try and force the moment into existence. Yeah. And uh, to the discussion about Mbappe, France uses Mbappe as a winger because they have Mr. Sexy Goals up top. Is that his official name? Is that on the back of the jersey, Mr. Sexy Goals? It should be. It's a very beautiful man. Yes, Mr. Mr. Sexy Gold. Uh, let's see. What else do we have on the board? Uh, Tom and Joy is loving the Weston McKinney to Everton rumor. So uh, keep an eye on that. And, uh, you know, you've got uh, uh, Kefsi wondering about Almada. Is, is he back in Argentina as a witness? Uh, no, I mean, he's there. He's still, he's still as active as what's going on. Uh, you never know when he could be called upon, but the fact that he was called up and is a part of the Argentine national team cannot be taken away. Uh, shooter, no, not a fan of Shaq Moore. Uh, thought he was brutal. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think Emilio, Emilio says everything feels hard. For this team, I think that only one aspect of this feels hard, and I think it's the goal scoring. I think that when you look at the talent in net, the talent in the back, the talent you have in the midfield, it's the goal scoring that feels hard with the talent that you've currently got on hand. Yeah, it's frustrating because you are kind of banging your head against the wall when you look at the players you have, Mm -hmm. where you feel like it should be more than that. Still struggling to find that guy to score goals consistently for you. Um, you thought you had it with Pepe, and the dude doesn't even make the World Cup. Yeah. Um, Sargent's been so hit or miss. Mm-hmm. Um, Peafock, I think. Peafock is the guy, I guess, if you're not going to take Brandon Vasquez because you don't think he's integrated with the group, yeah. I'd take a Peafock, yeah. personally. Yeah. Um, Especially, I mean, especially if, if Ferrer is just going to sit on the bench and collect dust. Yeah. You know, you look at uh, Kefsi looking at Iran. Iran played for the draw, defend, and counter. I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I tried to, to look at Iran out of the first 20 minutes, and I think that there were chances where Iran tried to, to get something done offensively going from, from left to right, but I mean, I, I think that you look at what uh, what what Iran was doing, and I think that the United States defensively, and especially with the athleticism, I mean, they were a faster. The United States was uh, plain plain and simple a faster team. So whenever the United States would lose possession, you would see Serginho Dest work back as quickly as possible to try to regain possession, or at least slow things down and frustrate Iran to where they couldn't get those long. Uh, moments of transition. They were, there really weren't a whole lot of those moments where Iran could stay in, could be in control of the match after after a turnover. So, um, you know, so I, I my gut, Kefsi, was to tell was to sit there and think that Carlos Kiroz 
was going to make it as difficult as humanly possible for the United States to try to get out a group. And I thought that the United States handled it very, very well. I don't think that the Iran made it difficult for the United States. I think that the United States not finishing made it difficult for the United States, in addition to what we saw you know, in, in getting the goal on the board. Uh, Emilio, U.S. is not Brazil in that they constantly reload. How about emphasizing what is a good team and push the envelope a bit? Well, I'm, that's going to, if you do something like that, that's going to come from uh, the individual who's the coach and the technical director that hires that coach. And so that's more, that's a, a, phil, that's a philosophical thing, I guess, more than anything else. Uh, shooter with a question. Do we have any good developmental striker for 2026? Off the top of your head, Jarrett, can you think of anybody other than this group being four years old? I mean, <clears throat> nothing like in the pipeline. Yeah. Um, guys will get older, guys will develop, and they'll come out of nowhere. Um, sometimes you see guys coming, sometimes they just come out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to pinpoint, man. It's, it's hard to like sit there and say, yeah, that guy's going to be the guy. It's the same thing we do with all the time with college football. And mm -hmm. when, you know, somebody's a blue chip coming out of high school, not everybody just hits and develops and it's magically there. It doesn't yeah. work that way. No, it does not work that way. Uh, let's see. Uh, getting into, and like I said, guys, just uh, put your comments in the Twitch pitch and we'll, we'll address them here for a little while. Uh, news of the day, and we got uh, some gossip rumor and innuendo as well. The matches tomorrow, Australia, Denmark, Tunisia, France. Group C is at 10 o'clock. Group D is at uh, 2 o'clock. And let me see if we can get into the uh, combinations and permutations of what uh, needs to happen, what is going to happen, uh, those kinds of things. So um, you got let's see uh saturday it is uh netherlands usa kick off at uh kick off at 10 poland and australia kick off at two that's match 50 uh looks like sunday is uh this is provisional so uh sunday would be france argentina england and senegal and then we continue to go from there so uh, that's what that looks like at the moment. So permutations and combinations. Let's see if we have uh, anything there when it comes to. And I've got the no. I don't want the provisionals. I want. I want what's going on in the world. I want permut permutations and combinations. So group of group state with state of play. Here we go. Okay. Uh, and then you give me back what you just you get what you just gave me. All right. So that's group A. This is nothing like, you know, sliding through all this stuff. Okay, Group C, stay to play. Poland with four points, Argentina with three, Saudi Arabia with three, Mexico with one. So this is this is what you've got to, to look at in Group C. Having avoided a defeat to Mexico, which would have ended their World Cup participation, Argentina have their Group C destiny in their own hands. Victory against Poland Wednesday guarantees not only their progression, but puts them in pole position to advance as group winner. To deny them the top spot in the scenario, Saudi Arabia would not only need to beat Mexico, but win by a larger margin than Argentina. Poland progresses if they avoid defeat to Argentina. One would guarantee them as group winner a draw for Saudi Arabia. Uh... So just, this thing just keeps sliding forward. It's a, a draw for Saudi Arabia against Mexico and a defeat for Poland would only see the Saudis qualify if Poland lose heavily. Check goal difference. As for Mexico, they have to beat Saudi Arabia to have any hope of qualifying. A win for Mexico, a loss for Argentina would should be sufficient for Mexico to finish as runners-up. A win for Mexico and a draw between Argentina and Poland would see Mexico and Argentina finish level on points Runner-up status determined by goal difference. Mexico would likely need to beat third-place Saudi Arabia by at least three goals on Wednesday. Group D. France qualified, six points. Australia, three points. Denmark, one. Tunisia, one. Remaining fixtures Wednesday. They're the late fixtures. Or they're the early fixtures, I think. Um, France, first team to qualify. Everything else to play for in Group D. Not sure if finishing is group winners, but a point and their final match against Tunisia will be sufficient, regardless of what Australia's result is against Denmark. If Tunisia do not win against France, Australia progresses as runner-up. 
as long as they don't lose to Denmark, while the Danes must win to qualify. If Denmark and Tunisia win, runner-up spot decided on goal difference, and then goals scored. So that's Group D. So that's what you, that's what you're staring at tomorrow, everybody, with uh, with all of those folks. Um, David, uh, the yellows. Uh, we got to keep the. I think the yellows in group. I I'll double check it, but I don't think the yellows move over. Uh, you've got, I think you've got Adams on Saturday. I think that's correct. And, uh, Will, why do you need Argentina not to win the group? Do you have a bracket that uh, we need to keep an eye on here? Is that what you're, is that what you're staring at? Just checking. Uh, let's see. Um, other stuff uh, today here in Atlanta was a big day. Garth Lagerway was introduced to the local media as president and CEO of, uh, of Atlanta United. And it was uh, good to to have uh, Garth introduced and give his uh, give his welcome to everything. I, I think I think his key card just officially was activated two days ago. So he's like Monday. Today's yeah. Uh, so literally Monday morning was when his uh, it was when his key card was activated. So yeah, he's hitting the ground running, and we will uh, talk about that more tomorrow. As uh, we look at Garth Lagerway now coming in as president and CEO and everything else that was there, Nick Alifi was there, uh, Jason was there, I was there. And so we'll uh, talk about that tomorrow. In uh, Jared, what's today? Is today Wednesday? My days are running together. No, Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. No, it's Tuesday. Oh, jeez. I guess that, that, that holiday weekend just absolutely screwed me up. So uh, Wednesday is normal. Uh, for us here. Dylan Butler will join us at 10 o'clock. So we'll talk about Garth Lagerway in the 9 o'clock hour tomorrow. Talk about Juve in the 9 o'clock hour tomorrow. Juve is an absolute mess when you have folks resigning right and left. It's absolutely crazy. And uh, there's a discussion going on right now that uh, Juve should be relegated out of Serie A because of all of the financial improprieties that uh, are going on, so we'll see if we can get Nick's perspective on it uh, tomorrow when it comes to uh, everything and the, uh, well, actually, you know what? Well, there's Nick Alifi right now. Uh, so before we get into uh, Juve, Nick, before we go, uh, we were getting into the, uh, the U.S. win over Iran. So from 30,000 feet, now that you've had an hour to catch your breath, what's, up, what's on your mind? I, I thought they played really well. The U.S. did. Uh, Iran, to me, looked flat in in the first half. Um, they're under significant pressures uh, to, you know, from a lot of different angles. So, uh, you know, that's not shocking to me that they really came to life in the second half. And, uh, you know, it was more of a back and forth affair. But I have no complaints with how the U.S. handled this. They kept trying to go forward. Um, I, I do hope that Greg is educating the players on the idea that if it's in the waning minutes, go to the game, corner, go to the corner. My, my good man, <laughs> run, go, to the, go to the blanking corner, <laughs> go to the corner. I think that was Haji Wright who got it with like two minutes left in stoppage time and just like decided to go for it instead of just yeah. walking over to the corner and laying down like a turtle. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you have to do, but I, if I'm Greg, I'm I'm having that conversation. Oh, brother! With all of of you know anyone who's wearing the kit is okay. Look, kids, <laughs> here's what we do in those yes. waning moments. But yeah, I, I have no complaints. I thought it was a good game. The idea that you're going against the Dutch is not exactly the worst thing in the world. Um, you know, it's a tough opponent, but it's somebody that they, that they can beat. And you know, we were going through some of the numbers. Uh, we were looking at the starting lineup, Nick, first and foremost. And uh, obviously a lot of folks were, I think it was at the front and the back where you had the concerns with Josh Sargent getting the start again instead of, say, a Jesus Ferreira or someone else. And then the, the possible concerns of having CCV starting with Tim Ream instead of Walker Zimmerman and having that combo out there at center back for the third match in a row. I, yeah, I have no problems with uh, how any of it shaped up. I have no problem with the lineup selection. I'm going to shut up when it comes to Greg and the lineup selection. Um, you know, I know that people are wanting Geo. I know that, uh, you know, people may have had uh, questions about uh, uh, Carter Vickers being, uh, you know, 
brought in. But I look, I I have no problem with Josh Sargent. I thought he played. I thought he played well enough. Um, you know, he took a beating. My God, he took a beating uh, mm-hmm. out wide. But I, I I'm over the whole. Uh, Monday morning, more Monday morning quarterbacking of of the roster selections. I, yeah. I think that it's fine. Um, Greg clearly has an idea of what the team can do. I I've made you know n- no no uh, I, I haven't softened my stance on Greg Berhalter. Um, you know, but he's so far he was aces in this game. And so w- with that being said, you're kind of past the point of micromanaging, you know, roster decisions and no MLS players to start. And, uh, you know, he knows what he's doing. He sees the practice. He sees the training sessions. So, you know, if he's not starting geo and he's not playing geo a lot, there's probably a reason why that's the case that we're not seeing and we're just left to conjecture. So, yeah. And, uh, I'm, you know, if it is an injury, the, the way that I look at it is why give your opponent one less thing to prepare for. And yeah, everybody, and it's the way that I described it, Nick, it was like the Stanley cup playoffs where if you have a player that has an injury, the coach will say, you know, it's a lower body injury or an upper body injury and he'll play. Everything is fine. You know, don't worry about it. Why, why give your opposition in a competition of this import something to uh, something to sit here and, and, and go, well, you know, Geo's cool. He's active. He's going to play. He's practicing all these kinds of things. Why give the opponent something to think about where it's less that they have to think about? Uh, right. No, I, I agree with that. I agree with not putting your injury business out there wide. And I'm not saying to everyone, don't, you know, you could, if you guys want to question the, the selection, that's fine. I'm not. I'm over, personally, I'm over the micromanagement decisions on that. I, to me, it's, you know, th- there's, there's a reason that, he when he looks at the roster, he says, "Okay, so someone's got two left feet, but they're more beneficial in this other phase of the game." I okay, I, I guess you're seeing something on the training pitch, or you're seeing something uh, personality-wise that makes sense to you to start it. So, uh, Godspeed. At this point in the tournament, you know you've worked out the permutations on who's going to start in what situations based upon what the other team's offering, and you you should have an idea of who comes in when and under what circumstances you're in the knockouts now. So there's no room to play around anymore on, well, we're going to try this out. We're going to try that out to, to me. That's off the table at this point. And the successful teams have an idea of you know some situational awareness on who comes in when and why. Mm-hmm. So we may not see it. We may say, okay, Shaq Moore's got two left feet and you know, it or, or and Robinson is, uh, you know, maybe having some heavy touches here or there. But it, if if Triple G seeing something that says, yeah. okay, this is what we got to roll with. I mean, you're in the knockout rounds, right? You know, if if you would have told me, you know, I told actually, I'll, I'll put it this way: if you told any U.S. men's national team fan that uh, that you're going to be in the knockout rounds, your first opponent's going to be the Dutch. Uh, I think there's a lot of U.S. men's national team supporters who would be a okay with that. Yeah. Um, you know that doesn't mean you know, if you want to complain uh, about it, go for it. But you know, I, I you walked out of there with a win today. You know, is there always room for improvement? Yes, I'm sure Greg's going to look at some of the selections theoretically and say, yeah, I probably should have changed this for this. But at this point, you you should know who your team's going to be. Right. It's shooter, baby. It's okay. Go for it. Shooter, go for it, man. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not. I am not not. If you want to complain, I am not knocking your decision to complain. Yeah, it's just, you know, looking back, right? And I think everybody knows that, I, you know, my loyalties lie first and foremost with, with the the Italian uh, the Italian national team. I've right? heard this. Yes. Yeah. In in 2006, when when we won the World Cup, it was more about. There, there were a lot of questions. All right, why is Luca Toni still, you know, Luca Toni has been hot and cold, you know, but he comes in and he scores. Okay, why is he not starting the next game? Well, you know, look, you won. So it's like, all right, well, I guess I can question all day, but if it's paying off, I, okay. You know, I may not agree with it. I may not like it, but, uh, you know, it, it is it is what it is. And so 
if you're a U.S. Men's National Team fan, you've got your you got yourself to a place where a ton of other teams want to be. It may not be with the the best person at the helm, but it, it is the person at the helm, and he, you know he did what he had to do today. So okay, all right. Yep. So uh, Will says another reason to bring on Geo. My large adult son is a student of the dark arts. Well, yeah, look, I have no problem with the dark arts. Uh, I think I made that also <laughs> abundantly clear. Uh, you know, the whole idea of that, you know, we are the Americans and we will play the game the right way. No, sir, we will not because... Uh, Let's bring Thomas and Philip of you there just a second. Right. If you, if you, uh, Terrence and Philip, yeah, absolutely. If you want to, if you want to get yourselves out of the tournament very quickly, feel free not to engage in the dark arts and play the yeah. game the right way. But... Uh, you know, people advance when the dark arts are employed. So, you know, you don't get too foolish, uh, foolish with it, but yeah, you know, engage with it. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, the question from Emilio, are you required to announce to the opponent, the player is eligible? I don't know the rules. If not, you don't have to reveal until the game is on. Is this accurate? Um, you, you, what you, you have everybody practicing and, I think that it's more of a visual thing, Emilio, than anything else where you want to have because you will have you will have media attending and you will have media who who want to sit there and and give out every piece of information about what they see. And what you don't want to do is with your 26 man roster, 26, 23 uh, with your with your roster, you don't want to sit there and say, well, somebody was off to the side or somebody was on a bike or somebody was something like, you know, some that's what that was. That's been my point, Emilio, is that uh, you want to, in an international competition, you want to make sure that everyone sees everything to where there's no evidence to the contrary, if that makes any sense. You're, are you required to announce to the opponent the player is eligible? No. But, but at the same time, because of all of the media that are there who will sit there and say something that could lead the opponent to thinking, oh, well, this player wasn't there, so maybe if they're on a bicycle, they you know they're on a stationary bike, they may not be around. That's one less thing we have to worry about. No, you don't have to. You don't have to reveal uh, until the hour before who, who's your starting eighteen. You have that set roster, and you have your subs that are available for you. But you have your eighteen, and you have your eleven, and you don't have to do that till an hour before the game. And so. Uh, you're like, it's just all of this stuff on the in-betweens. You don't want to sit there and give the guy, the other guy, something else. To, you want to have them prepare for everybody. That's just been my biggest thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, look, I don't care if my team suffered a machete attack in the middle of the night. If, if, if the minute I get in front of a, a, a microphone, how's your team? Baby, we're up. We're mm. good. Everybody's up and running. There's no problem. You know, uh, forget about the fact that we actually had to start a toddler in the game. It, do, it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> everybody's good, baby. We're, go- we're 110 miles an hour. Right. Yeah. No. It, yeah. Emilio, it is not like the NFL, but uh, I, Gustavo is asking about Garth Lagerway. Uh I know we probably will get into it a little more tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning in the first hour and some with Dylan Butler when he joins at 10 o'clock. But Nick, you were there today mm-hmm. and you had the chance to catch up with both uh, Steve Cannon from uh, AMB Sports and Entertainment and Garth Lagerway. What were some of your takeaways from the press conference and the introduction of the new president and CEO of Atlanta United? Very personable, very friendly, very process oriented, which uh, if you are an Atlanta United supporter, you should be 100 percent happy with uh, there. One thing about Seattle, you can bag on the fact that their fans may think they invented the sport um, and, you know, perfected it here in America. They have had a repeatable process that has led them to significant hardware. And this gentleman in Garth Lagerway uh, understands that process. He's ready to implement that process. He's here as a, uh, as a CEO and a president Mm -hmm. and not as a general manager. He, uh, one of the questions I asked him, I, I said, look, you know, one thing across MLS is that there have been there's been a greater focus on inbound transfers than outbound transfers. Which player can we bring in to strengthen a squad? As where Atlanta United has made some significant money on outbound transfers. And I asked him what his philosophy was uh, regarding that or if it came up in the interview process. He said, well, funny you mentioned it because I asked him that exact same question uh, during my you know initial candidacy. And what was told to me by the board was um, 
we are here to win trophies. That is priority one. Uh, you know, outbound transfers, if it happens, great. But job number one is to win trophies. And that's that's how he, you know, that's what he was told. That's how we interpreted it. And uh, and so that's, you know, because he had mentioned Almarone and Pitti and, you know, whatever you think about the Pitti transfer inbound, certainly um, you, you can be very happy with the outbound because Atlanta mm-hmm. United made some, some good money on it. So, you know, I, I appreciate anyone who has a process because that is something that is a repeatable action. It's not something that happens by accident. You didn't just happen to draw the ace uh, out of the deck. You didn't happen to, uh, you know, you know, bet on black and come out big on the cash. It, it, it's not a thing of luck. You know, it's it's something where you know what what wins, you know how it's done. And he believes in that. He's he's a, he's a lawyer by trade. So, you know, just like Darren Eels, he's going to understand the ins and outs of uh, the MLS the labyrinth of codes and, and bylaws. He understands talent identification. Uh, I don't know how you can watch any Seattle team and, uh, and not say that they lack the ability to identify talent. Um, they seem to always find a way to do it. So I was very impressed uh, in my conversation with him. Uh, Steve Cannon, I, you know, the conversation we had was a little bit more <laughs> Army Navy centric. Uh, yes, it was. Like, yeah, because he's he's a West Point grad, you know. So I said, hey, look, you know, if, um, you know, Steve, if I come up to, uh, and say, hey, go Navy, am I going to be barred from uh, Mercedes Benz Stadium for the foreseeable future? And he laughed and said, nope, nope. And then we had a great conversation uh, about the uh, the upcoming Army Navy game and and some some past times when. Uh, when Navy got the better of army and and how they were able to turn it around. So it was all in all, it was a, it was a good event, but if you're an Atlanta United fan, I understand, you know, there's a lot of questions. The man's been on the job for like all of two days. Yeah. So there was, you know, he hasn't had a time. If you're a process oriented person, the last thing you're going to do is come in clean house day one. You you know, if you're process oriented, you're going to say, here's how we do business going forward, you know, and this is what worked. This is what the things that I believe in. And here's, how I empower people to to do the best that they they can do in their job, and so uh, that is enough out of you, airborne DJ, sir. <laughs> uh, however, uh, as I was saying, um, you know what you want to do is empower people. So people who uh, you know may have a job where you know certain things have have constrained them in the past you try to figure out freeing them from those constraints is going to be the best thing for business some of the other people you may say you know we're going to redefine a role or we're going to streamline or we're going to give you more responsibility so there's a lot of things he's going to be looking at and so for anybody who comes in says you know looking for well, what about this player what about this position what about this guy not the guy to ask no it's not the guy to ask just sit back and wait and uh, and see how it shakes out. But I appreciate the fact that he's he's a thoughtful person. Most of his answers are big answers. Um, you know, it's uh, and so it, it it you know I can appreciate that. You know, there are a lot of times that questions were asked of him. He said, "Look, that's a question that cannot be answered in one soundbite. Mm-hmm. It's a big answer. It's going to take a long time to answer. This is something that's probably going to need to be." Um, you know, answered after I get a chance to look at some things from a, from a larger perspective. So. Yeah. And the, the word that uh, Lagerway used was nuanced. Yep. And it, it's you, it, there is no straightforward answer to some topics. It is not just a to B sometimes it's going, you know, turning right at the stoplight and you work your way around the block and then you figure out, you know, where, where you're going in, in your, in your path. And, and the other thing that uh, one of the other things that it was, uh, I thought it was key to hear from Garth Lagerway is that, you know, you, he will bring, he will ask folks to bring in these ideas. Obviously he's going to be the last guy to uh, discuss and he, he's going to be the point of the spear. He's going to be the, the decision maker in all of this, but he wants to have that kind of discussion of, okay, what's your idea here? What's your idea here? Let's, let's bring these ideas together so we can all go forward, but I will end up making the end decision when it comes to it. Yeah, I, 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 and one thing, I'm a Marine, uh, Mr. Uh, Mister Airborne DJ. I'm a yeah. Marine, so uh, we, we some more fighters, you know what I'm saying? Yes, the Navy boys are, are they're, they're, they're great taxi drivers. They're great, ta- they're wonderful Uber, uh, you know, so I, but, 
you know, there are Marines on the team, so that's who, that's who I have to love and support right there. But uh, we can talk more about Garth tomorrow. I want to close yeah. out because i got to get ready for uh, the Duchess's birthday dinner here. Oh, there you go. In, in just a moment. But <laughs> with Juve, because um, I've had a few people ask me about Juventus, and I definitely don't want to get off uh, the show here without talking about it. But Juventus is currently in a lot of deep water here. Uh, what If we remember a few months ago, Guardia di Finanza, the police uh, policing arm of the Italian government that involves anything that with money. Um, it's think about the the Spanish tax man with guns is mm-hmm. essentially what Guardia di Finanza is. If Guardia di Finanza shows up at your door, it's legitimate. It's actionable. They know. And so, uh, th- via you know through the COVID time, with uh, with Cristiano Ronaldo's uh, contract with a couple of other contracts, they employed a little shell game to move money around and they got busted. And so you're looking at a a loss of about 200 million Euro right now. That's And If you look at what the money that they were talking about from, uh, from the super league, it almost would have just covered that. (laughs) So it it makes sense why Agnelli was one of the people screaming and yelling for super league, super league, super league. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, yes, Airborne DJ, I know. It's much love, man. It's much love. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, with with Super League gone, essentially, you, you people can't go after Real Madrid. Uh, the money's too big. The, the power is too centralized, so you can't destabilize them. But Juventus is very vulnerable. And without the protection of Real Madrid in, a, in sort of a unified direction of Super League, they were left out to dry. And so you have, you know, members of the Italian government who are looking to make a statement that big wigs are no longer protected and there's no more big wig than Agnelli and Juventus. And so the, the, the resignation of the entire board does not mean that Agnelli, Agnelli is, is a, you know, ostracized or divorced from Juventus. No, it just means he's no longer a, a, a member of the decision making apparatus, but to have him off the board, uh, it, it's shocking. It's amazing. And what it looks like to me is that Exor, the parent company of Juventus, uh, which is ran by another one of Gianni Agnelli's grandkids, um, it looks to me like they're trying to divorce the board from the sporting apparatus. To try to say, hey, look, the board's gone. Punish them. Bar them from having anything to do with the club. And leave the sporting unit alone. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, you know, La Liga is already raising a stink about it. Um, they're going to have to make an example. I'm thinking minimum 20 to 30 point deduction yeah. to bury them at the bottom of Serie A. Uh, the, the biggest, the biggest issue is going to be if they get relegated, which is what a lot of people are screaming about. I don't think they're going to get relegated. I think it's going to be a points deduction massive fines they're gonna to have to sell off about half the damn team and this is gonna be very different than the 2006 squad um that was relegated and you had a lot of those stalwarts stay uh that ain't happening with this group of Juve players so they're gonna to have to sell like it's gonna be fire sell uh it's it's, it's fire sale it's gonna be a disaster zone for them so i as much as Juve hate as i pour out on any of the shows or i previously did when soccer over there was up and running weekly I don't want to see Juve relegated. Serie A needs Juventus. The yep. Italian national team needs Juventus. I just want to beat them every time Milan plays them. <laughs> but, you know, you they, you have to have Juve there. It, it's like what happens if Alabama, if, when Alabama was terrible and Notre Dame was terrible. Um, and USC know, was terrible. USC was terrible. Co- college football wasn't as interesting. When the Red Sox are terrible, when the Yankees are terrible, when it, it, it's just not as interesting. So you need those big villains in your life to to bring a bit of drama and excitement. And I want a 30-point deduction. If they've been cooking the books as long as they say they have, I want a 30-point deduction. And they're going to be forced to sell players anyway, so make it happen. Uh Anything that involves a Juve player at this point is on the table. The, the sale of any player for Juventus is on the table at this point. They have to get cash fast. They have to uh, to balance the books as quickly as possible. It's not going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. And they have to they have to show UEFA 
that they are removing their own fangs, for lack of a better term. And yes, they have to have a heel. We need a heel. And so uh, Juventus was Ric Flair for a long time. And uh, in fact, I wouldn't even say they were Ric Flair. I would say they were like Randy Orton because he had some boring promos as like ultra heel Randy Orton. His matches were great, but his promos got kind of boring after a while. I'd say that's probably more Juventus. But Juve is in deep, deep, deep water right now. And, And they needed Super League to work out so they could cover the financial impropriety that's taking place. This has taken place. So... As far as the manager goes, uh, Allegri's contract is there. It's significant. <laughs> That's you're probably one gonna, use. Yep. You're probably going to have to, you know, convince him to leave on his own accord. Uh, you're going to sell a ton of your top line players, including uh, McKinney. McKinney's probably going to end up going to the Prem or uh, Germany and, you know, for far less than what he should. This Another reason why Juve should be thrilled that the United States is into the knockout rounds because his his value just keeps going up. So, and if you're a team that is looking for a player like uh, Mosakan, you know, a striker that's available, yeah, I mean, make the damn call. You know, uh, you know, yeah. As far as and what's going to happen with Chiesa? You know, Chiesa's not going to go get knocked down to Serie B. So where's he going to go? He can't go to Fiorentina. That bridge has been set on fire with gasoline and dynamite. <laughs> so where's he going to go? Is he going to go to Inter? Arch rivals of Juve? Mm, that's going to be tough. Is he going to go to Milan? Uh, they, if, they, if Milan sells Rafael Leal for $150 million, eh, yeah, maybe you make that move. But uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting in the next couple of days. But you're going to hear a lot of people talk a lot of trash. They're going to say, yep, Juve's getting relegated. They're going to scream it. A lot of blue checkmark accounts. Don't buy any of it yet. I think, again, point deduction. I don't think they're going to get relegated, but uh, stranger things have happened. Airborne. That, I got well, bounce. All right, so you're going to bounce. Uh, chances of the rumored are Nana McKinney and cash swap. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think all of it's I think all of it's on the table. All right, well, so uh, go enjoy the Duchess's birthday. We'll catch up tomorrow morning. All right, see you tomorrow morning. That's uh, Nick. And uh, Jarrett, hopefully, is going to go spend time with Ivy Board and uh, make sure that their dinner is in uh, one good piece. And, and yes, KFC Lagerway did say no social medias. Uh, So, yeah, he is not going to be on the TikToks because he admitted that you don't want to see him dancing or anything like that. So uh, who's who is who's cryptic signing? I think it's gone. Well, we'll see. We'll see what uh, we'll see what the social media team at Atlanta United comes up with after that. But no, Garth Lagerway does not do social media. And so you will not be seeing him doing the TikToks. Uh, so, OK, so heard it here first. Uh, Vlahovic to Bayern in January. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, thanks for hopping on late in the afternoon for SDHPM. Uh, actually, before we go, uh, let's do gossip rumor and innuendo before we go and uh, get all of that squared away and see what the uh, the Tuesday the Tuesday gossip is before we go. Chelsea close to completing a long uh, signing of Christopher Nkunku from RB Leipzig on a long-term deal worth more than 60 million euro. That's from Fabrizio Romano. Uh, PSG and Messi has not agreed to join Inter Miami, uh, say that uh, <laughs> despite reports suggesting he's close to doing so. Roma considering making a move for Leicester City and Turker defender uh, Suyuncu in January from Calcio Mercato. Chelsea unwilling to let Christian Pulisic leave on a loan deal this winter would prefer a permanent move. That's from the four-letter paper, so take the information at your own risk. Brighton have opened talks with Norwegian side Mulde to sign 19-year-old Ivory Coast forward David Datro Fofana. Garrett Southgate set to recall Jordan Henderson and Kyle Walker to the starting lineup for the, that was the Wales match. Bayern Munich believe they've finalized an agreement with uh, Conrad Leimer uh, from RB Leipzig. Sunderland, among a number of championship clubs, chasing Villa's English striker Cameron Archer in January. Manchester United open to recalling on loan players in the January window, including English right back Ethan Laird at QPR. 19-year-old Tunisian midfielder Hannibal Mabry from Birmingham City. And Ahmad Diallo from Sunderland. That's from the Manchester Evening News. Wigan expected to name Colo Torre. As their new manager on Thursday with the former Man City Ivory Coast defender set to leave his coaching role at Leicester. Manchester United have been quoted a price of £100 million if they want to sign Argentina and Benfica midfielder Enzo Fernandez in the January transfer window. Remember, you saw him here first and you heard the discussions from Jason from his time at Defensi Justicia. Last piece of news, Manchester United also interested in Spain Real Sociedad midfielder Martin Zubimendi. 
welcome us a 52 million pound release clause that is from our friends at the express so we'll be back at it tomorrow tomorrow is uh wall pass wednesday so whatever's on your mind it's about any of the news, any of uh, the stuff from a hungover from the U.S. win over Iran. Remember, we'll have the two matches at 10 o'clock and two more at 2 o'clock. And uh, we'll have that to talk about, Group C and D tomorrow as well. Dylan Butler should be joining us at 10 o'clock to break down everything that he's been seeing in the past seven days. We'll get him to talk about uh, Iran and the United States and the knockouts and everything else that is attached to that as well. So, uh, once again, thanks for hopping on for an SDHPM. Game was kind of important. The Lagerway presser uh, felt like we needed to be there as well just to kind of see the, the new president and CEO of Atlanta United as well. But uh, later today, we will obviously have the uh, the World Soccer Review. That'll be up, uh, giving you all the goals that happened uh, during the day and get you prepared for tomorrow. So for everybody here, for Jarrett, for Nick, uh, for Jason, I'm just John. Thanks for hanging out with us for a round of SDH in the PM. We'll be back at it tomorrow morning, 9.05. Since it is the end of the show, it's a mucha plata, y'all. Play it safe, and that means I get to do this. We'll catch up with you in uh, oh, this one's, uh, about uh, 15 and a half hours. Play it safe, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.